I had a realization the other day, and that is that journalism is not an inherently interesting subject matter. What it is and what it requires is for you to leave your place of business or residence, go out into the world, and find people that are more interesting than, what, than you or what you are doing. And that's what it's all about. Uh, so with that being said, my name is Erin Lee Carr. I'm a video producer at Vice, uh, specifically Motherboard.tv. Motherboard covers science, technology, uh, drones, sex, uh, the body, and the dark side of the net. That's why I joined it, because it's all weird. Uh, so I really quickly want you to look at this image and uh, get past my like, super fancy title about fear. Um, and look at what it is. And I don't know if you can really see it, but it is a plane flying in front of the sun. And so while this event is not outside the ordinary, these things happen all the time, the exact moment and specification in which it happened and the astrophotographer that took it is extraordinary. Uh, the photographer's name is Thierry Legault, and he lives in the suburbs of Paris. Uh, and so I had the extreme pleasure of going with motherboard editor Chris O'Coin to go and visit him and ask him some questions. And so, uh, you know, Terry's work is important and why, you know, we find it remarkable is not because of the picture. Yes, it's a beautiful image. But what it is, it's an amateur becoming an expert using technology. And so with the evolution of the technology, like the telescope equipment, the tracking system and the camera, Terry was able to become one of the most premier astrophotographers in the entire world. You know, and that's what, I think that's what sort of storytelling is about. Finding these people. You know, Teddy had a day job. He had a family. He had a whole life. But instead of just having a hobby, he had a career. He had something that, you know, remains in something like incredibly beautiful as a time throughout history. So uh, I'm going to circle back a little bit and talk to you guys a little bit about myself. So uh, I was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I still say it like that, Midwestern proud. Okay, New York, whatever. <laughs> um, so I got my undergraduate degree at University of Wisconsin-Madison in communication arts. Woo, badgers. Um, and so as I sat there in sort of the classrooms, I wondered, and watching the new classics like Gummo and Kids and Dancer in the Dark, I was in proximity to excellence, but I was very far removed from it. You know, how could I, as a 21-year-old, 22-year-old, make anything like that? That had huge budgets. It had a huge cast of characters. There were so many people involved. And here I was this kid in Wisconsin just watching movies. Uh, so the closest I got to documentary filmmaking was hanging out with my roommate who handcrafted a pterodactyl costume. Uh, yes, you, you made that. And he would go around State Street, the main drag in Wisconsin, and haunt it in a drunken fashion. I got this cannon with a mini DV tape, just like filmed him as he like, went around. And so that was the closest I'd gotten to documentary filmmaking. Uh, so, yeah, I know. I have the tape. Um, so, flash forward, I uh, studied abroad in the Czech Republic at a film conservatory to get some hands-on experience. And I was facing some pretty turbulent headwinds as it related to the economic job market in 2010. Was I going to be able to get a job? Maybe. Who knew? Uh, so a friend sent me a link to VBS TV, which was Vice's uh, online video department at the time. And I was like instantly hooked. And I'm not going to be an evangelist for Vice. That's not what I'm here to do. But I would just say that at the core concept, when I went through the archives and started watching the footage, these were not classically trained filmmakers. These were not, you know, I mean, journalists, you know, some now they are. But these were, these were people who wanted to tell stories that were going to go out into dangerous parts in the world and tell these stories. In my, uh, you know, sort of nascent time in my life, I believed I could be that person. I could go to those dangerous places and make those movies, uh, you know, much like every other kid who writes to Vice. Uh, so I had my interview in the very epic, cool uh, location of Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And I remember getting off the L train and, you know, I was pretty Midwestern at the time and not so cool. And so I was, pretty, I was intimidated. You know, everyone's good looking. I'm just, you get off the train, you're like, oh, the model factory. I don't know. Don't, <laughs> you don't feel like you have to laugh. Um, so, so I went into Vice. And Saroosh Alvi, the co-founder of the company, brought me into what's called the Bear Room. 
And it's called the bear room because it has a giant stuffed bear in it. Yeah. And so um, he later would uh, offer a position as an associate producer at the company. And so I was, uh, you know, I was getting up to sort of shake his hand and somehow I just fell in front of him. <laughs> just, just fell and he had no idea what to say. Um, and so I realized I was off to a very shaky start at Vice. Uh, so the first two years uh, of my tenure at Vice, I learned through osmosis. I learned by listening. Often I was not the smartest person in the room. You know, great sort of knowledge and learning comes from like listening to the people around you, much like the ethos of TED. And so I remember one time I was sitting at my desk kind of dealing with these administrative duties, you know, like, you know, setting up shoots for producers and a, a man named Brian Anderson, who's the now features editor at Motherboard, uh, you know, sent me a G-chat. He's like, I hear there's something going on at Zuccotti Park. And being, you know, the hardened cynic that I had once become after two years in New York, I said, there's nothing happening in Zuccotti Park, come on. There's like, event-based video is the worst. Nobody wants to look at it, it's the awful, it's awful. And he says, I think there's a story there, you should come down with me. So I left my desk and I went down to Zuccotti Park and lo and behold, there was a story there. And, you know, there was a lot of mainstream news outlets covering it, you know, you know NBC, CNN, like, what is this hippie factory, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I, you know, I thought there's a tech story. And the tech story was Isaac Wilder, who's pictured here. He's a 23-year-old college dropout who built a wireless network in Zuccotti. And while the film is less about Occupy as a, you know, as a, as a whole, it's more about the internet being a government sanctioned project from the very start. And people like, uh, people like Isaac using that government funded project to give themselves a voice, to have their voice be heard. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, so I want to, I want to shift a little bit and go to sort of my thesis of this, this talk. And I want to talk about fight or flight. Life is a series of moments, it just is. And so whether it be, you know, as a young person giving their first TEDx talk, or as a journalist in an uncertain industry, or even, you know, as a storyteller, teller, really trying to figure out and tell a story, these are the moments. You can either choose to fight and stay with it, or you can flee. Uh, you know, and there's, there's very more to, like, I will even go to more specific moments, like, you know, say you're on the subway and you're trapped underground for five hours and people are looking hungry. Do you know what I mean? And so, even, so there's these moments, you know, so New Yorkers, I believe, choose to fight. I think, had it not, had I not been in this environment, in Williamsburg, in Brooklyn, in New York, I would have sat, you know, hanging out in my pajamas watching Netflix. Probably would have. You know, it's the easiest thing to do. Uh, but because I'm in this fiercely competitive environment, I choose to fight. I choose to every day do something that makes me nervous. You know, uh, and hopefully after the talk that we heard tonight, something that makes me happy. Uh, so uh, something that uh, after, in my tenure advice, I have always come across a cast of crazy characters. And nobody made me, well, one person that made me incredibly nervous, you may recognize this dude, his name is Shoe Nice 22 <laughs> Whew, he's a weirdo. Um, he is a Gulf War vet uh, and a divorced father of two living in upstate New York who will eat anything and everything for the purposes of YouTube fame. You see in this slide, he is downing a bottle of shampoo, uh, a tube of Icy Hot, some sort of alcohol concoction moment, and a tube of wasabi. Uh, you know, I could barely click on this dude's YouTube page, let alone go meet with him. And he has like two million subscribers. So, uh, you know, I went to upstate New York and I filmed sort of a stunt with him. And there, there was a sort of an ethical moment where I, had, I took issue with it. Was I being exploitative? Was he exploiting himself? The thing is, the, the beauty of uh, non-hosted documentary films is that Chris got to speak for himself. It wasn't me, it wasn't me editorializing. He said, this is why I am the way I am, and this is why I like being the way I am. And we can choose to agree with it or not agree with it, but that's the power of filmmaking. But I would say that nothing made me more nervous uh, than that of my uh, last story. And that was about Cody R. Wilson. 
Cody is a 24-year-old University of Texas uh, law student who is attempting to build semi-automatic weapons using a 3D printer. Yeah. Um, I was reading the New York Times one day in an you know, incredibly inform informative article uh, by Nick Bilton that spoke of Cody. But I, as I saw it in print, I said, this is a video story. This needs to be a video story. I don't see any video on it. And so, you know, the only video was his, like, terrible YouTube page called Defense Distributed, where, like, some dude with a handy cam was like, shoot the gun. I was like, okay. So I called, uh, excuse me, I sent an email to Cody, and I said, I want to make a film about you. And he said, I don't like to talk on email. We need to get on the phone. The government's watching my email. I said, that's normal. Cool. Great. Um, and as a 21st century lady, um, I can text, I can email like a wizard. But when it comes to actually getting on the phone and communicating with a human being, it's incredibly difficult. So there's the fear thread. Um, so we, I got in a room, I called Cody, and I said, all right, I want to make a film about you. Let's do this. And he says, I'm talking to NBC. I'm talking to the New York Times. I'm talking to BBC. Why should I talk to you? Whoa, that's aggressive. Um, but, and, I, and I don't want to you know, knock the mainstream media, but I do believe, like I watched, a, I've later watched a couple of clips, and NBC's like, this guy wants to give guns to your children. And I mean, while that's true, <laughs> it is not the whole story. So with a, with a voice of confidence, as, as much as I could muster, I told him, we, Motherboard, are the right people to tell this story. We have created a series of documentaries about the fringe outliers of society in a balanced and nuanced perspective. You know, this is a very easy video to make look bad. I want to talk about it from all angles. I want to talk, I want to tell the whole story. And he said yes. So it was exciting. Um, so briefly, I just really want to touch on this small moment that we are in the golden age of documentary filmmaking. And I really tru truly believe that. You know, often the, the pieces of art that shake the world come from documentary filmmaking. Uh, I was, you know, cruising Netflix the other night, and I uh, happened upon David Francis' How to Survive a Plague. And that's about sort of the survivors and non-survivors in the AIDS crisis, but it's a beautifully curated doc. And searching for a carvel is the worst. It is the hardest, one of the hardest moments in documentary filmmaking. Eileen, a vice editor, is here, and she's nodding her head. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that was, this was incredibly momentous. And so something that's kind of an old example is uh, Alex Gibney's, this Enron, the smartest guys in the room. Being ignorant to sort of the financial uh, corruption at the time, after I watched the documentary, I was incensed at the crimes that had been perpetrated against the American public. Alex Gibney and his, the people that worked with him said, this is what they did, you know, this is the evidence, this is what, what can be done. And I believe it has really informed the way I tell stories. And there's a, a movie that's not on this slide right now that speaks to the greatness of documentary film. It's called The Invisible War. And I believe it's online. And that's about sort of the pervasive issue of sexual assault in the US military. Um, and it just so happened that somebody in the, uh, in the military, in the government, saw that, saw that film. And the legislation, legislation changed. And the process was changed forever. So we are in an age where we can change things. And that's powerful. And I'm not going to stand up here like, documentary films are powerful. My medium is powerful. But I really, truly do believe that. And that's why I'm up here speaking about it. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about sort of platforms and distribution. With the evolution of DSLR technology, with the kind of entrance of uh, free platforms such as YouTube, Vimeo, Reddit, we are in an age where our voices can be heard. And so I'm going to speak to a personal example, and I'm going to talk to you about two people's big first breaks. Uh, I come from a family of storytellers. My dad's a reporter. And so in, uh, that's the first one. In 1982, my dad wrote an article for the Twin Cities Reader that was about pr police brutality in Minnesota. And it was no you know, small bag of peanuts. You know, people talked about it. Uh, certain offending officers were fired. It was kind of a big deal his first story. And so when we looked at it, uh, I, I thought, uh, you know, we tried to think about the circulation. About 30,000 people saw that. 
uh, you know, fast forward to 2011, and I was getting ready to make a short science film about tiny, tiny microbes that can exist and thrive in space. I went to uh, rural Virginia and hunted tardig uh, tardigrades, the microbe. Right? We hunted tardigrades by way of a microscope. And I talked to a naturalist named Mike Shaw. It was short, it was snappy, it was incredibly well edited by Chris O'Coin, live stream shout out. And uh, that video got 10 million views. Whew. <laughs> Whew. Uh, and while there's no rhyme or reason, and I totally acknowledge that, you know, that is the exception, it is not the rule, it is kind of incredibly powerful that these small little films that, you know, you can just sort of think up and talk about can reach that many people. Just think about if that article, you know, I know it's a different, it's editorial versus video, but just think about if that video, that editorial piece had been seen by that many people. Online video is the revolution. I truly do believe that. Okay, Lo let's go back to Cody. So Cody was recently in the news as he has uh, now com uh, completed a fully functional 3D printed firearm. And so over the past week, 100,000 uh, CAD files, the CAD file is how um, the sort of the program is downloaded to create a gun, 1,000, uh, 100,000 files have been downloaded. And at sort of my moment, that made me deeply, deeply uncomfortable. What if someone had watched the documentary, found out how to find the CAD file, downloaded and printed a gun and shot someone. What is the culpability and responsibility of someone like me? And in journalism, that's, this is nothing new. There's always been sort of a responsibility and ethics system. But now that we can reach so many people, what is one to do? And so I spoke with my, uh, my colleagues at Motherboard, and I'm gonna herald back to my earlier point at the beginning, and they said, this is not about you, this is not about your voice. This is about going out and finding people that are doing interesting things, good, bad, evil, the ugly, coming back, creating a cohesive argument, and letting the public at large make an informed decision. So, with that being said, I usually communicate by uh, showing documentaries and not by giving speeches. This is my first speech. Uh, and um, I would like to uh, play the trailer for the, the film Click Print Gun. And uh, I have a small warning this may invoke fear. Thanks. Where do you think your project fits within this greater discussion about gun control? If we could print a gun, other people could do this. Like, what if we gave it away, you know, open source style? You know, what would that mean? Gun control for us is a fantasy. <laughs> In a way that, like, people say, well, you're being unrealistic about printing a gun. I think it's more unrealistic now, especially going forward, to think you could ever control this technology. The only things recognized and like promulgated in this culture are like irreversible things. To have a symbolic gift like the printable gun does so much ideological damage and violence to these ideas. Simply that like it can't be ignored. 